Ladies and gentlemen, analysts and associates, welcome to your managing director secretary's favorite podcast, The Big Swinging Dex Podcast by Liquidity and Mark Moran. This is not financial advice. You'd be a bottom bucket analyst to make investment decisions based on what is discussed on this show. Welcome back to another edition of Big Swinging Dex. Lit, as always, how we start every episode here. How the hell are you doing? Doing great, Mark. Uh, we were just out in the Hamptons. Uh, you know, at the time of this recording, it was a blast. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it speaks for itself. Anyone who was there knows how sick it was. So. Um, shout out to Friday Beers for inviting us out there, and uh, yeah, that's uh, the the first of many to come uh, collabs, if you will, with Friday Beers, huh? Just getting started, Mark. You know, I'm really excited about today's episode because we have someone who is very unique. Uh, and someone who, you know, we both have gotten to know over uh, both in person, but also over the Internet and specifically FinTwit. We have with us today Eric Langen, who is the president and CEO of RCI Hospitality Holdings, Inc., the ticker that we know and love to be Rick, R-I-C-K. You know, Lit, hearing, hearing myself talk about CoinFlex, it reminds me that I will actually be going to Austin without you. You have a, a previous engagement, but I'll be going to Austin for the Consensus uh, Crypto Conference. That's going to be Thursday, June 9th through Saturday, June 11th with CoinFlex. So if anyone is out there, then uh, I hope they feel free to, uh, to reach out and can connect with some people. Yeah, I love that, Mark. I mean, I, I don't envy you from uh, our time at Permissionless, <laughs> where, uh, you know, people are like, hey, man, love your shit. Uh, you know, can I get a photo with you? And I'm like standing right next they, to you. They'd be like, so. is, is the real lit here? And, I was, and I'd look around with you right next to me like, ah, you know, I don't know. I think he's somewhere. In, yeah, in I'm like, I, I think. I, I think he just went to the bathroom to throw up. I don't know, but <laughs> yeah, he's been he's been drinking a lot. He just threw up. So yeah, I'll uh, I'll continue to be like you know I think he's somewhere in Texas, but I'm not exactly sure. He's pretty mysterious, pretty mysterious. <laughs> but speaking of someone who who actually has been pretty mysterious uh, in kind of the public light as a as a CEO of a publicly traded company. Eric Langen, who we're going to bring on, who uh, he is the president and CEO of RCI Hospitality Holdings, Rick, that they are the only publicly traded strip club uh, in the country. And we're going to learn about his kind of fascinating story of when he sold his baseball card collection for $44,000, bought his first club. Now he's been president and CEO of Rick for over 23 years and how he's grown that from one club to now they have 49 clubs across the country and then they have bombshells which is a military themed restaurant that they have 12 locations in and this is going to be so unique because one um you know it's one of our first ceo um interviews that we've had you know we've had a lot of founders mm -hmm. and ceos but this is kind of the first you know publicly traded company established one that we've had they're also our first investor relations client. So having done their first uh, publicly traded company earnings call on Twitter Spaces a few weeks ago and continuing to work with them, this is going to be a fascinating interview because I think it's something, you know, it's a company, one, not a lot of people know much about. But two, I think Eric is very different than what one would assume. And, uh, you know, you're going to hear that with some of these stories. I really uh, am excited for people to listen to this interview. Yeah, it's going to be great. With that being said, should we take it away? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Eric, welcome to Big Swinging Decks. It's been a few weeks since we last saw each other in person at Tootsie's. It has. And we cannot be more excited to have you here because, you know, as the first person that we started working with to do investor relations and to do the first ever earnings call on Twitter Spaces, we had a phenomenal time. But, you know, it's really your background that I think is something that everyone should know about because it's so unique. It's so fascinating. And before we kicked it off, I just wanted to kind of give the shareholders, which is what we call our listeners on this podcast, a bit of a background about how we actually got paired up and met. And that was through Adam Wyden, who is the largest individual shareholder of RCI Hospitality Holdings, Inc. 
and he's also the son of uh, Ron Wyden, the senator from Oregon. So right. he had tweeted at me and ultimately got drinks with him in New York. And he was like, you know, for one of the companies that I have a significant stake in, I, uh, I really think you guys at Liquidity could be a great megaphone. Put us in touch. We came up with some ideas and we executed on it and we'll be continuing to work together. But I think you have, uh, I think it's safe to say that you become officially a staple in the FinTwit community and they love you all for it. So. <laughs> oh, I have my I have my lovers and my haters. I would say, you know, but uh, it, it's, been, it's it's been a lot of fun for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's it's definitely been a lot of fun for me. Uh, hopefully, I get verified soon. We finally got all that stuff in, and uh, that will make a I think a huge difference as well. Because I still got a lot of people that don't believe it's me. It's like, oh yeah, right, sure you are CEO of a public mm -hmm. company, sure. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, yeah, Eric, I mean, it you, sounds ridiculous. It, yeah, lit. Yeah, no, you have some uh, some hysterical. Uh, and positive um, <laughs> energy uh, on the platform, which I think is something that, you know, uh, FinTwit, the, the community of everyone in finance, um, you know, it could get very toxic. And I think you approach it from a very positive, you know, response and don't let the trolls like get to you, which it's um, it's admirable. You know, I, I think uh, Mark well, and I deal know, with a lot Eminem of trolls. says it better. It's the haters that gave me the strength, right? So, <laughs> exactly, of course. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I've been, dealing, I've been dealing with that since I was 19 years old. So so, so that's actually uh, a great transition. At 19, what, what happened? How did you start off in this journey? Well, I was married and divorced at 19. And so when I got divorced, my friends started taking me to this strip club in Fort Worth, Texas to try to cheer me up. And next thing I know, I was dating one of the entertainers from the club and uh, we were having parties at my apartment all the time. By the time I was, you know, about 20 and a half or so, I guess, we decided, why are we taking these girls to somebody else's club? Let's open our own. You know, the girls would complain about how they were treated. They would complain about different things. And we said, well, let's just open our own and we'll do it right. And that, that's kind of how it got started. And, and I and sold my baseball card collection. Yeah. How, how much you sell know, that to baseball raise my card collection cattle. for? Uh, about 44000 and change. Oh wow! What, what it was you worth about that? three hundred thousand, but I just wanted a strip club, you know. I was, <laughs> I always say I was, I was, I was, I was too smart, you know, for my own good, right? <laughs> so. What uh, so, so what was in there that made it so valuable? A bunch of uh, Joe Montana cards, mm -hmm. uh, old, old, or I mean, uh, a bunch of old Mickey Mantle cards in there, a lot of other cards from the '60s and, and early '70s. Uh, but 1981 was my football phase, and it happened to be Joe Montana's rookie card. Yep. In that one, so I had about a, I think about 180 Joe Montana rookie cards, uh, and I I pulled one out uh, and gave it to my brother, which he got rated as a PSA 10. There's not very many of those mm -hmm. uh, out there. In fact, I, maybe four or six, I think. I don't, I'm not mm. even sure anymore. It's been so long. I after I sold my cards, I kind of got out of, and I was like, uh, now it's it's painful because I think <laughs> of all the cards I used to have, right? <laughs> so. Well, I, it's painful, but then you turn it into you know a a 500, 600 million dollar business. So would love to hear a little bit from your perspective of kind of the beginning stages of rolling up these clubs. How did that start after the first club to kind of get to the point where you now own 49 clubs and then a separate Bombshells franchise? Well, I guess the true roll-up started. I mean, we were just trying to expand and get bigger, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so I think the true roll-up story probably started in about 2005 when we opened in Rick's New York. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I decided that if we were going to, we either needed to go private or we needed to get to New York city, uh, in about 2003, 2004. So we started going to New York, looking for locations. We finally found the location, uh, at 50 West 33rd where Rick's Cabaret is located at today. Uh, at the time, I think the market cap of the company was, or revenues for the company were $6.7 million total revenues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we paid $7.6 million for the club. And what's funny is I had investors that came up. And uh, they came about three weeks after we bought the club and there was nothing left. We had literally <laughs> gutted it. It was three walls. It was three walls held up by two befores and steel beams. Because <laughs> uh, we basically, did, we tore the whole front of the building mm. off. We tore everything out of the inside mm. of it uh, and just did a full remodel on the property. So everybody thought I was crazy. They're like, you paid $7 million for that and then tore it down? So, wow. And, and yeah, so that's and, and, uh, sorry. No, and, and that, that's a very... Um, memorable location you know it's uh, right across it's the one right across from uh, madison square garden right yeah mass square garden it was a block from madison square garden uh directly across from the empire state building yep right there at 30 33rd and broadway basically yeah. premium location square. yeah and, and exactly. for context anyone who's um you know uh listening to this you, you mentioned seven million you know and and what you spent and uh just looking at the rick's 
2021, uh, you know, uh, report, it, it was close to 200 million in top line revenue. So uh, things have definitely, you know, uh, expanded significantly since. Yeah, well, that's what started the roll up. So we bought that club. Then we bought Tootsie's Cabaret in Miami in 2007. And that's when we got the real, you know, the investor community jumped on us and our stock traded. I mean, at one point in 2008, before the before the crash in early 2009, we were trading at a higher multiple than Playboy. Mm -hmm. So, and that's when Hef wow. was still around. So that was a, you know, for us, that was like, everybody's like, oh, you've made it, you've made it. I said, eh, you know, because I always had a joke. The, the standing joke was when I, when my stock was worth 30 million, I was gone. Mm -hmm. Of course, my stock got to like 32 million. They're like, oh, you're retiring. I'm like, ah, I'm too young to retire. Uh, it's just a number. <laughs> I, I'm not going to go for a number anymore. <laughs> no, when I, now I'm just going to go till I'm tired. So. <laughs> well, well, speaking of that, actually, you know, one of the most interesting moments of my life, I have to say, it came at around 1 p.m. on the Monday, so Monday, May 9th, when we were doing the earnings call. And the stock was down a little bit, and I had a comment, and we're on the second floor of Tootsie's, and uh, you say something that you said, look, you know, I was down $2 million earlier in the day, now I'm up 700000 and you showed me your E-Trade account. It was like $38 million on an E-Trade account. And I was just, my mind was blown. And you go, oh, it's nothing. It's just Monopoly money. And I, I think of that once a day. <laughs> well, I, that's what I always call So, So, you know, I, I'm not selling the stock, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I always say, it's, I always call it Monopoly money. I said, you know, I can't really do anything with it, mm. but it sure looks good stacked <laughs> under my side of the board, right? Oh, yeah. So Exactly, exactly. You know, it's just a scorekeeping thing for me, I guess, at this point. Uh, I just have too much fun, you know, uh, uh as they say, live in the dream, man. I mean, every day, you know, we wake up and, yeah, we have our, you know, our, our, our negative sides of the business, of the lawsuits mm -hmm. here and there, the other little other little annoyance things. But uh, but overall, I mean, it's just a great business to be into. Uh, if, you know, as you meet, you've, you've, you've got to meet some of our management team, some of the employees, and you can see, I mean, they love what they do. They love the company. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, you know, they, they're, they're part of something. And so that's became my like massive extended family. And now we have like almost 3000 employees nationwide. And so I think about them and I think, so that's, mm -hmm. that's a lot of driving force for me, you know, their kids and their families and the things that they do. And, uh, you know, I, that's what gets me up every day and says, okay, I got to push harder. That's, um, which that, I'm sorry. No, that, that's fascinating. And I think like something that people probably discount is the fact that, you know, there's a kind of uh, family component. People actually love what they're doing because, you know, people think about it from a, hey, you know, strip clubs or whatever, right? Like that they come with it with a negative connotation, but it's like, hey, this is a business. People are loving what they're doing. And like, why like get upset at what people are doing if they're doing it, you know, for something that they love to do. And that's something we also talk yeah. about a lot, you know, just uh, do what you want to do and, and love what you want to do. And success comes from that. That's why I love Web3 so much, right? That's what this whole community is about, decentralization and, and just freedom and, and uh, enjoying, do, doing what I want to do, not what mm -hmm. I'm told to do, not what, you know, uh, not what I'm expected to do. I want to do things that I love and I make a living from it, right? I want to make a living from it. So, uh, you know, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. I've probably worked about six days in my life. <laughs> you know? So about six days, I think there's been times I you know, wasn't real happy with what I had to do, but uh, but most of the time, uh, it's fantastic. I love it. And, and we'll touch on the Web3 stuff in a second. But one thing that I wanted to kind of piggyback on is so you, know, you are the only CEO of the only publicly traded strip club company. And, it, you know, Playboy would probably be the closest competitor if you were to pick one. But, you know, why do you think that is? And how do you kind of view RCI compared to, say, an OnlyFans or just overall in the market? Because I know you guys have Admire Me. Maybe talk to us a little bit about that and just kind of the general market that you see and how that's going to change in the future. Well, I think the, the biggest thing, I'm trying to embrace things that's building our next generation of clientele. And that clientele is currently 25 to 35 years old. And mm -hmm. they don't party like their grandpas and they don't party like their dads did. Uh, they have a different outlook on life. They definitely have a different outlook on sex, on uh, adult businesses, adult entertainment. Mm -hmm. I mean... You know, I, I know it's it's sad, but they've been watching, you know, crazy sex videos probably since they were 10 years old. Right. And they could log onto the Internet. Mm 
Yep. Uh, and I so think that was the first time I got in trouble for looking at porn on a family computer around 10. So, yeah, yeah that's about here. right. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. So that's when I caught both my sons. <laughs> so, you know, uh, you know, it's like, so you just kind of like, okay, so, so it's not as taboo to mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. And what's really great, I think, is... Uh, there, there are much that this generation is a much more live and let live generation. I think a lot of that has to do with uh, uh, probably the you know the, the gay and lesbian movements mm-hmm. uh, and other you know other civil rights movements of their time. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's great personally. I mean, I absolutely think that uh, I, I've been a big freedom fighter for a long time, and people don't realize. In our industry, we've been fighting legal battles since. But let's put it this way: I opened up my first club, and in the first three weeks, I was arrested fourteen times or thirteen Ooh. times, I think. Wow! For operating too close to a house, my business was too close to a house. Even though the federal courts had ruled it was unconstitutional to enforce the ordinance, the city decided to enforce it anyway. Hmm. And so that was my welcome. Welcome to the business. <laughs> so I said I had more money than brains at the time. That, that's. I just thought I was really smart. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Huh. I, and so, so I've been fighting these legal battles with cities and states for many, many, many years. That, I mean, you know, I, I, I think like that's just remnants of, yeah, like the legal system and, and just something that's archaic. And when you look at, you know, uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm kind of speculating here, but I doubt OnlyFans uh, CEO or management's getting, you know, um, arrested uh, that many times and running into all these issues um, from that perspective. But You know, I think like this all, I think when you are talking about the future of of Rick and the future of the clientele, one thing that uh, Mark and I have talked about is what I've uh, dubbed Symponomics, which is basically, you know, the the digitalization of this clientele that, you know, gets adult entertainment. Um, They're paying people virtually through an app and, and things like that. And it's very different. Yeah, it's probably... Kids aren't uh, engaged in things as they were in the past. And I think, you know, you are definitely seeing these trends and executing on but them. But once I get them into our brick and mortar business, they go insane. Mark's seen it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's like, this is real, you know, it's like, you know. Uh, yeah, I don't have to pay someone for a video that uh, shows like half a nipple. Like, yeah. <laughs> Well, and, and I think, yeah. too, Eric, you made a good point one time uh, when you were talking that, you know, a lot of these these guys on the Internet, because of, you know, a bunch of cultural factors, they're oftentimes scared to go talk to women. And I think one of the interesting things about a strip club is that you can actually have, you know, one on one conversation, uh, you know, in a, in a non-sexual way, just like getting to know someone. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, the really interesting thing about the Web3 strategy for you guys is that you're almost using Web3 to then bring people in to Web2 and then actually funnel them into brick and mortar, which I think is pretty fascinating. And so, you know, in, in terms of the brick and mortar, though, the one thing that we have to hit on, because both the, both me and Lit being former M&A bankers, in your corporate presentation, you have this beautiful slide that says that there's 2,200 strip clubs out there, right? And one of the interesting things that touches on the legal point you made is that it's really tough to open a new strip club, you know, because of all the regulation that you essentially can't do it these days. So there's 2,200 clubs. There's about 500 that meet your acquisition criteria. And so a lot of the owner operators are getting older, wanting to sell, and you're really the only person that they can sell to. And so what is kind of the future acquisition opportunity look like for you in terms of just buying these clubs, adding EBITDA each year? How do you see that going? Because it seems like, you know, you could go out, you could buy 40, 60, whatever, but you're doing a very thoughtful three to five type, you know, at a time process. Yeah, well, you know, you have to manage them. Mm-hmm. You know, triplos are very management intense, especially when we take over existing operations because, A, we have to stop all the bad habits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We have to put in all of our control systems, make sure all the money ends up in the cash registers, right? Uh, that and gets to the banks. Those are the important things, for especially for shareholders. And, uh, and, and we have to make sure that uh, all of the best practices, uh, how to treat the guests, how to treat the entertainers, how to treat the wait staff, uh, mm-hmm. all those things. Uh, you know, we don't, if you grow too fast, you're going to lose some of that in the translation. And it takes time to really ingrain that into the next set of management, the next set of management, the next set of management. So uh, we don't want to go too fast, but there's, it is really heating up right now. In 2008, we did 11 acquisitions. Okay. Uh, and to give you an idea, I told somebody, you know, two weeks ago, uh, I literally got 11 phone calls from different brokers or club owners in one week. 
Um, wow. And I've had a couple more this week, and I expect a few more next week. Uh, everybody's calling and starting to talk to us. Uh, I actually had a, uh, a meeting with the director of operations earlier this morning, and I said, hey, look, we've got so many possible acquisitions right now, we've got to sit down and start picking and choosing. We got to say, okay, we're not going to waste our time on this one right now. We are going to focus on on these for right now, and and basically get our I, I call it our preferred list, right? What's mm-hmm. our preferred acquisition list? We prefer to buy this one. We prefer to buy this one than this one and this one. However, you know this owner wants too much money, or this owner wants this. You know we we're negotiating, or you know the licensing issues in this one. So mm-hmm. you know let's let's kind of make a timeline. Uh, and so he's working on it. I'm going to work on it some this weekend. Mm-hmm. And have, and, uh, have you used bankers we're together in the past? Next week for that. For for this? Yeah, we used uh, Merriman. Merriman was our first investment banking okay. firm. Uh, we used them for the capital raise in uh, 2007 and then again in 2008. Hmm. Uh, but uh, since then, we really you know, haven't used uh, banking because we've just generated too much cash. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, so like, I mean, like for, for the new acquisitions of these, um, you know, uh, nightclubs or, you know, anything else, like you don't have to engage an investment bank to help you evaluate like what's a fair price or anything like that because you're, you know, doing this every day. Is that correct? Yes. Well, I think the reality of it is, is so we had an auditing firm that came in for, mm-hmm. for, for two years and they, bought a $35,000 report. Mm-hmm. And I got a copy of that report from them and read it. <laughs> 95% of that report was my filings, my TV interviews, <laughs> my magazine interviews, yeah. my talks on how you evaluate strip clubs. I'm like, you could have just asked me guys and saved your 35K. <laughs> so it's, it's really hard to uh, do it. And, and I mean, I know a lot of the other top industry guys, I know what they'll pay for something or mm-hmm. what they won't pay for stuff. Uh, and it's, and, but I know what they can pay also. So that's the difference. Even, just because they would pay mm-hmm. if they can't pay, they're not, you know, uh, and so we're able to, to use those, uh, those metrics as well as part of our valuation. And I think anytime you're buying something less than five times, you know, a, a, an EBITDA, a trailing EBITDA or adjusted EBITDA number, it's, it's kind of hard to go wrong, right? You're, you're basically saying you have 20% returns, mm-hmm. uh, day one. And that's without any improvement, any increase. We're going to bring in national buying power. We're going to lower cost of goods. We're going to uh, bring in, you know, put all their insurance on our insurance company. We're just going to lower our overall cost of insurance. We're going to, mm-hmm. you know, lower a lot of costs, mm-hmm. and we're going to improve typically revenues anywhere from I would say our average is probably fifteen to twenty percent, and in some cases we we will increase increase revenues as much as forty percent when we take over a new location. And how do you think about the value of the real estate itself? You know, I, I assume like the one Great in New, New York is um, probably more on a lease basis uh, or correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, for other ones that are like standalone buildings, um, do you think about it from a you know traffic standpoint, real estate, uh, you know, underlying real estate value accretion? Well, well I'm not going to pay for the light I'm not going to pay for the license twice, mm-hmm. right? So if I'm paying you for the adult business at a, at a, at a five times three to five times multiple, mm-hmm. I'm going to pay you bank appraisal value for the real estate. And what we do is we call our bank. Mm-hmm. They have a you know a list of appraisers. They order the appraisal. We get the appraisal back. If we both agree, great. If not, I will let the seller at their cost get a second appraisal. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll we'll compare the two, see where they're at. If we can come to an agreement between the two, fine. If not, then we agree to do a third appraisal and do an average of the three. And that's mm-hmm. typically how we've done the real estate. Uh, we charge rent based on an eight percent cap rate. Mm-hmm. So if uh, you know, if they're paying X amount of rent, then we will, if they're paying too much rent based on the appraisal value, we'll give them an add back to the adjusted EBITDA. If they're not paying enough, then the EBITDA gets charged for that. Right. Because we have to have an 8% return on the real estate. And we do own the New York club, by the way. So um, oh, really? okay. we bought that property. Yeah. We bought that property in, I think 2012. So. Got it. And, Amazing. And so owning the, owning the real estate too, it also makes it a unique issue for you because normally you know if you're taking out a lot of debt from these wall street banks then they're going to be more inclined to service you on equity research right but you guys only have property level debt which is a very unique thing uh, for a company to have and so you don't have to t- and it's all seller finance so you don't have to take out these mega loans and so you know you don't have as much equity research coverage it makes it very unique but what are some of the other things that you view as being you know very unique to your role as ceo of rci 
Well, I mean, my role has evolved so much, mm -hmm. uh, especially, you know, post COVID, it's really starting to change, uh, uh, because we've relied on other people. So I, I tell everybody, I tell all my top guys every day, you need to wake up and you need to be trying to work yourself out of a job. Mm -hmm. You've got to hire somebody that everything you're doing, break it down, figure out how to find specialized people that can do better job than you on those particular fields and and have them take over so like bradley you know my cfo mm -hmm. hired him uh gosh i think almost 26 six years ago now yes yeah. yes yeah, six eight years ago right no six years ago and uh you know he was one of those guys i said okay look this guy is super smart mm -hmm. he understands systems and that's what we were lacking our our, our internal accounting was lacking systems as you can see from the internal you know, from the material weaknesses from the auditors and and whatnot we we our cash was always right mm -hmm. trust me I, I i've been i could do cash on the back of a napkin okay no problem our cash is always going to be right and you know we never had a problem with any of our numbers mm -hmm. but what what the material weaknesses were were there could be problems mm -hmm. that could be missed and i said yeah they could be missed if i not watching over it 24 7 mm -hmm. but i watch over it 24 7. and one of the <laughs> things that you know they were saying is look you're getting too big you can't watch over you know, $300 million worth of revenue, every penny. And I was like, why not? But, but they're, they're, they're kind of right. I can now because the systems that Bradley put in place make it so easy and so phenomenal mm -hmm. uh, to do it. But, but what, what I think I was missing when they were telling me this was, is, was the opportunity cost. Yes, I can spend all that time doing those things. Mm -hmm. But if I will allow someone like Bradley to come in and build a system that does all my checks and balances yep, yep. for me, then I can take six hours a week of work and turn it into 12, 15 minutes. Yeah. And uh, it's been great. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of the things you kind of learn as you're growing a business. I mean, Lit, Lit and I learned that every day where it's like, yeah, we can do it, but is it the most effective use of our resources? Usually it's not, right? Um, <laughs> you know, so and then a similar kind of toss uh, softball question, right? What do you think people don't understand about the business that they look at it, they say it's a strip club, they don't want anything to do with it in terms of investing or even understanding it. What are th kind of three things maybe that you could tell people to communicate the message of RCI? Well, I'll tell you the number one thing that I think people miss. They think that, that the majority of the women in our industry are exploited. And I think the majority of the women in our industry are empowered. Uh, mm -hmm. I, in fact, I was in Minneapolis at VCon and one of our managers came up to me and she set me down. She says, Hey, can I have, you know, a few minutes of your time? I know you're busy, but I, I really need to talk to you. I said, yeah, you can have all the time you want. Let's, let's go. I, I thought something was wrong. Right. So mm -hmm. I want to, um, you know, you see on Twitter, when somebody says, this is wrong with your club, I, I try to immediately respond. Yep. And so I thought something was wrong, but she takes me over the side and she wanted to, she wanted to personally thank me. She goes, I started out in your clubs as a waitress. Then I became a dancer. I danced for a long time. Uh, as you can see, I'm not, uh, you know, in the shape to be a dancer as I used to be. Uh, but I got into management and she goes, I'm happier than I've ever been in my life. And it's all because of you. And I wanted to say, well, it's all because of your team. Mm -hmm. You know, it's what I try well. to explain. I said, look, it's, it's the team. It's not just me. I'm not. Yes, I set up the teams to succeed, but it's actually the teams that have to go out and succeed every day. And uh, and so she was just like very, you know, very uh, appreciative of everything. Mm -hmm. And I said, I said, no, we appreciate you <laughs> because without without those managers without mm -hmm. the entertainers without the waitress you know th this company doesn't grow from six million in revenue mm -hmm. in, in 2003 mm -hmm. to you know to 300 million i think what we're, we're on course to do in uh, 2023 mm -hmm. Well, and, and no, I know. And, and that's that's something, you know, even um, you remember my friend uh, at, at Tootsie's from Detroit that she was saying that she had yeah. moved down here to Miami to work because it's the safest club. It has a reputation for that. Naturally, there's 100 and what, mm -hmm. 70 odd cameras in there. You know, that right. doesn't happen at a lot of other places. And I think, you know, this is considered by some to be a vice stock. Right. And it's like at the end of the day, though, you know, 
not everyone is, you know, born with a silver spoon in their mouth, right? And a lot of people are in an right. abusive relationships, all of these things. And, and what you guys are doing is really empowering people to make their own money. And I think that's something that not a lot of people understand. And that when you look at it from that perspective, it's very different. And, you know, for me, I think I'm, I'm very vocal on the internet of being anti ESG because I think it's such a virtue signaling thing that's totally fake and that all these companies just change their rules for. And I think it'll be really interesting when OnlyFans goes public that, yeah. you know, you'll, you, You'll have to have people say, okay, well, you know, for, for an RCI, for an OnlyFans, are we just going to exclude them and say that they don't meet ESG criteria when, in fact, you know, you are empowering sex workers? And I, I really look forward to that uh, that narrative starting soon. And, and, and you know, it's contrarian. I hope they get public. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, very contrarian of you, Mark, because, I mean, yeah, like, you think about what the political climate and all these things, ESG, and, like, even Tesla, I think, uh, right, Elon mm -hmm. Musk was railing that, he um, or, or Tesla like was excluded from this ESG fund, even though they're like the largest, you know, um, yeah, electric vehicle. Yeah, they're trying to save the planet. Like, yeah. I mean, they're solar, they're battery. They're, yeah, you know, and, and, and so nuts. okay. Yeah, and so yeah, Exxon Mobil, Exxon Mobil's high on the list. <laughs> like, okay. Exactly, and, and I think going back to uh, this whole thing of you know what's misunderstood, um, you, you hit it on the head, Eric, um, earlier about the this next generation is um viewing things differently and you know in new york they like uh was it i forget decriminalized um you know uh, uh adult work and people are saying look sex work is real work and it's mm -hmm. um much different than you know our father's kind of you know upbringing and how they view these things so um i'm very much so of, yeah like people are free to do what they want to do if it's done in a safe and uh you know, um, uh, yeah, safe way, legal way. And uh, I think people still operate under this like legacy framework. Um, same thing with like marijuana, you know, it's, um, it, it's very safe at, at, at that and people are legalizing it. But back in the day when it was right. fully illegal, it's like, oh, you're, you're a pot smoker. Wow. You, you're, you belong in jail. And it's, you know, it's it's just yeah. I, I, yeah. I always thought that was crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I always said, you know, we 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 do random drug testing at our clubs, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I would have everybody say, well, uh, you know, you had nine employees test positive for pot. I said, I don't I don't care. Mm -hmm. I said, do they have cocaine, heroin, meth? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. things that are going to make them steal or cheat yeah. or you know, do things you know that are not good for. For, for business or for the other employees. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, alcohol is probably the most dangerous drug, you know, when you between marijuana and, and, and alcohol, right? yep. you know, and you, it's you legal. get high, you go sit on your couch and fall asleep and pretend you're driving. <laughs> <laughs> Been there. So, <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> And, and so, you know, I, I think just to round that off, like, I, I think it's so easy for like, all, and, and it's funny for us, because it's like having gone from like high finance and Wall Street to now shit posting on the internet, and, and working with, you know, bridging these worlds of where, you know, it's very easy to sit, you know, uh, up, you know, in your ivory tower and say, oh, okay, this is how we're going to decide ESG scores, this is blah, blah, blah. And it's like, end of the day, it's all crap. But what that does, though, is it affects who can own your stock. And I think that's like a very fascinating thing, you know, most endowments can't, right? It affects a lot of institutions. And so that's part of the reason you came to us, part of the strategy with Twitter and engaging with the shareholders yeah. and everything. But one of the things that I really wanted to ask about going kind of back into the finance uh, realm of things is that you ran the company a certain way until about 2016. And there was a book that you read. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, that book and then how that impacted the management? Sure. So basically what happened in, in 2015, I did, I, we'd had three years of growth our, our, and our stock was just heading straight down. We went from like, I don't know, 18 to $6 or something. And so I basically fired all of my financial advisors said, you know, the, the head was, I was going to buy a club. I just, I, I discovered basically fraudulent accounting mm -hmm. in their numbers. Uh, and I said, I can't, I'm not buying this, you know, I'm not paying this for it. It's not, something's not right here. And uh, so the investment bankers, or the you know the bankers that we were working with at the time, got and financial advisors got really mad at me, mm. and I couldn't figure out why they were. You know, it's like Dude, I'm not going to buy something that's not real. Mm. You know, so I'm sorry. Well, they were losing seven hundred and eighty thousand dollars in fees. Ooh, yep. So yep. of course they were mm -hmm. very. You know, they were getting upset about it. I'm like, look, I don't care. I, my due diligence <laughs> tells me I can't buy them. I'll go buy something else. And they just rode me so hard that I fired them. All. Mm -hmm. I just I'm done with all you guys. You don't care about this company. All you care about your fees, and uh, and then 
I had a, an investment group that came with me out of Cal or came to me out of California. They were they bought about two uh, percent of the company, I think, at the time, and they said, "Look, we'll buy we'll buy up to five percent of the company uh, if you'll publicly state a capital allocation strategy." Mm-hmm. And I said, "What do you mean?" They said, "Here, you know, read this book, The Outsiders, by William Thorndike." And so I read the book, and I said, "Oh, this makes sense." And uh, we adopted a capital allocation strategy. We publicly put it out. These are the three things we're going to do, right? And it's the same capital allocation strategy we have today. But what re- the real evolution of the capital allocation strategy was when I realized it's not just about physical money capital. Mm-hmm. It's about all capital, uh, property, right? We had, we had properties where the real estate was worth, say, $3 million, but the club that was operating on that real estate was making hundred thousand dollars a year. Not a very good return. Mm-hmm. Let's sell the let's let's close the club. Let's sell the real estate off because it's not the club's not the best use for that property. Mm-hmm. And let's take that three million dollars and go reinvest it into uh, you know a better uh, you know better capital allocation for that capital. And we started doing that, and you'll see the 2017. I've been with this company since 1998, mm-hmm. and 2017 was the only year that revenues declined year over year. Now, free cash flow increased drastically, but revenues actually declined because we were selling off underperforming assets. So then we started applying that to people, right? The staff, myself, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our director of operations, uh, regional management, club level management, and said, okay, if we're paying these people this much money, what type of ROI are we getting? Uh, And part of that helped us get rid of more underperforming locations because what we realized is, we're paying a guy, you know, $150,000 a year and 70% of his time is being focused on a club that's underperforming because the market is bad or the location was bad or, you know, whatever the reasons were. And when we got rid of that location, put him back into the top locations, all of a sudden his 70% of his effort was going into a location that was making us a ton of money. And it started making us even more money, right? Because mm-hmm. he was able to sit there and focus his time and energy and his skill set on on the right uh, on the right locations. Uh, and, and you know, the rest is history. You see, the uh, I mean, the effect of it has been unbelievable. Uh, if it hadn't been for COVID, I mean, I don't. We we would be, uh, you know, I think a year and a half farther ahead in our in our plans here. Mm-hmm. But uh, but COVID mm-hmm. taught us a lot. Uh, it leaned the company out. We cut so much fat because we had to. Mm-hmm. I mean, we actually got operational costs by paying. We still paid all of our all of our general managers across the country, all of our regional managers through COVID. In New York, we paid people 14 months for not really working. They they came and helped open other stores, whatnot. But we, we took care of all of our people through that deal. And uh, we learned that we got our we got our actual our burn rate down to like 2.8 million mm-hmm. a month from. 14 or 13 i think it was before wow. so yeah I'm, I'm, it was amazing what we were able to do i'm looking at the uh the stock chart from uh the low of march 2020 um to you know like end of 2021 and the the stock exploded and like you know a thousand percent i mean that's uh yeah. that's that's wild I mean, it, so how did was that um growth do you think driven by this cost cutting measure or was there a something to the story or was there some sort of meme stock, you know, bonanza well, around there's a couple this? catalysts. Yeah. There was a couple catalysts. One of the catalysts was recovery place. Mm-hmm. Wall Street, Fintway, everybody got into recovery place. Who's going to come out on top of their industries mm-hmm. as they come out of COVID? And they started realizing all the small mom and pop restaurant chains were clo- getting closed down and restaurant operators and they figured that the same thing was going to happen to strip clubs. And some of it did. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing is we settled our, you know, two and a half year SEC investigation uh, that was brought on by the short attack in 2018. Mm-hmm. And so our stock was so depressed already for the amount of cash we were making uh, because of the SEC investigation. So I think you just kind of had a, a you know, I call it the perfect storm kind of came together. Uh, you get those opportunities, maybe, you know, I don't know four or five times in a lifetime if, if you're lucky. And I think we just got lucky and that came together. And now we're going to take advantage of it through, you know, multiple, you know, we yeah. bought, basically we've already bought 13 clubs this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're looking at, you know, several more over the next few months. And then in 23, uh, mm. 
I don't I don't see it slowing down at this point. That's the owners yeah. of clubs are older. Yeah. And, that's um one thing I wanted to bring up, and I'm sure you've seen this tweet and probably responded to it. It was uh, from I probably should uh, you know blank this out, but it's uh, at Botticelli Bimbo on the, on Twitter that she said the strip club is sadly a leading indicator, and I can promise y'all we are in a recession. LMAO. Um, and to your point, you know you've shown that you know all your clubs are or or you know you're experiencing record traffic like right. what, what do you uh say to that tweet i say you're she, if you read some of her other tweets she is trying to charge customers 1200 to 1500 dollars an hour mm -hmm. and they got away with that during covid when no girls were at work right and club a club could only be open a few hours only a few girls would come in and you know guys were dying to get out mm -hmm. the problem they have today is the clubs are full of entertainers again Mark, Mark seen it. Yep. Our, our screen at Tootsie's holds 212. And we were told that they had square feet of performance yeah, area. Yeah. And they had 60 girls that weren't on the, you know, we couldn't see on the screens because there was too many girls there. And that's the, that's what these girls don't understand. And the new girls, these new, you know, 19, 20, 21 year old girls who haven't been in the business for 15 years or 12 years, 10 years, as some of these girls on Twitter that are posting have been on. You know, I've worked for this club for nine years, and I'm like, okay. The new girls are coming in, and $400 to $600 an hour is typically going rate nationally per hour mm -hmm. for, for entertainers. That's that's the what I consider the national VIP rate. Uh, you know, your top girls probably are getting 1000 still. Mm -hmm. uh, but your average girl, especially the new girls, are 400 600 bucks an hour. And so you've got these girls who've been in the business for a long time, and they want to charge 1200 to $1,500 an hour. And the guys are coming in and going, where's the value? Right. You know, I can go spend three hours with this girl. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd, li I'd rather spend time with you because, you know, <laughs> yeah. you, you taught you the gift, you got the gift of gab because you've been doing this for a long time and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm attracted to you and whatnot. But, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's like it, you, you, when you go in the store and there's, you know, two, t you know, two, two kinds of meat and one meat's a thousand dollars and the other meets a hundred dollars you know <laughs> you're, you're gonna buy the steak that's a hundred bucks more than likely right because they're not yeah. that different a ribeye is a ribeye right yep and i i think that's kind of the you know kind of that what we're seeing uh in, in the in the industry and it happens every mm -hmm. time now if i had to say is it a leading thing of a recession normally i would say yes because the quality of entertainers go up incredibly during a recession but mm -hmm. the difference this time is it's not necessarily recession what it is it's a return to work right you had the great resignation everybody quit oh, i'm not going to work anymore i'm gonna do this well guess what reality starts to set in you go oh wait i do have to work because i want to eat i <laughs> you put gas in my car uh, i got to pay my rent want that ribeye uh yeah exactly yeah. and so i think you're seeing just a lot of people return to the workforce and that's why I think recession is going to be if, if the Fed does it right and the and the which that's a long shot. Right. We all know that. But, but <laughs> if they can do this right, if they play it if they play it fast enough, but slow enough on these rises, they could they could get us into a soft landing because of the consumers that are newly entering the market. You just heard Bank of America raise minimum wage to twenty two dollars an hour. You have mm -hmm. a lot of other major companies raising minimum wage. We just did some pretty some pretty decent increases across our chain mm -hmm. as well and that's because we were able to pass the costs on to the consumers now at some point you're not going to be able to and it's going to slow back down but right now we've been able to so we're, we're doing these things and that's putting more money into the system mm -hmm. right which is going to cross more inflation uh so it, it's kind of a it's a very delicate juggling act i think i i i do not envy what the fed has to try to do here uh and, and I think the number one thing they've got to do is they've got to fix the supply chains. Mm -hmm. uh, because as long as the supply chain pressure's there, you're, you're never getting inflation under control. Because there's a certain group of people that are going to pay whatever they have to pay to get what they want. Yep. Especially in this day and age. Makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I think uh, on this kind of more macro level, uh, as it pertains to the stock price and and how analysts view this i mean do you think there's some sort of um 
disconnect, you know, in, in the market, like you're not getting fully valued based on the cash flow that you're bringing in that say a different company is probably getting that full valuation. And, and then just as a secondary question to that, your kind of web three and, and tech foray, you know, through the, the tip and strip and the adore me stuff. Uh, do you think that would change the perception of it being valued as a pure kind of like restaurant and uh, nightclub ownership to something like a multiple expansion for owning tech? I think almost all disc, all cash flow is being discounted right now mm -hmm. because what, what what they're betting, what the bet is, and the short, I've read some of the short theses on our company, is the short thesis is that, you know, revenues are, we're going to go into recession, revenues are going to drop 20%, margins are going to drop from 30% to 20%, and so therefore, you know, our free cash flow is going to drop tremendously and our EBIT is going to drop tremendously because the, 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 the money we're going to lose is the high margin service revenues. And so while revenue drops 10%, maybe even it drops 22 or 23%. Uh, and so if we're currently at 30, that drops us down to 22%. Mm -hmm. And on the lower revenue, you know, that's, that's, that's the thesis. But what I keep trying to explain to them is the problem with their thesis is there has been no decline yet. Right. In fact, service revenues are increasing right now still. Mm -hmm. uh, New York is, I was talking to the regional up there, and there we, we were in February, we were lucky if we were getting one $10,000 plus dollar tab in, a, in, a, in, in the month of February. Mm -hmm. In May, we're averaging four a week of ten to $25,000 tabs. So the big spenders are coming back into the clubs right now. Uh, and if we continue to see that, I mean... That's why I say I, I don't see the recession at this point. Uh, and our and our and our blue collar clubs are still doing very very well, even with gas at five six dollars mm -hmm. a gallon. Uh, and and at, maybe people aren't buying as many pairs of shoes or uh, apparel, but when it comes to experiences, they want experiences. They want to go out. They want to party. They want to have a good time. And what they don't want to do is sit at home on a Friday night or a Saturday night right now. Or on a Tuesday night, really, on a Wednesday night. I said, <laughs> we'll know when our Mondays and Wednesdays start to decline. That's the first thing we always see go. Mondays and Wednesdays start getting weaker and weaker and weaker. Mm -hmm. And weekends actually get busier. Mm -hmm. And so I've been seeing the weekends get busier. And I've been worried. I'm like, oh, the weekends are getting busier. But then I go, well, Monday's busier. Oh, it's Wednesday's all busier. busier. <laughs> okay. Mm. Yeah, every day is just, you know, yeah. we're just, we're just, the numbers are continuing to increase. Uh, you know, it's two, three percent, but you know, we keep going two, three percent a month. That's going to be some big numbers. And even if we just stay the same, mm -hmm. I mean, we're running record numbers right now. I mean, what we said in March, we only March numbers are actually out mm -hmm. 24 million in revenues in March. We said April beat March. May is on course to beat April. Uh, we'll see how June goes. I just, you know, uh, it is summertime. That's typically when we start to slow down June, July, August, a little off. And then about mid September, it starts getting dark early and boom, business comes right up. After Labor Day, it gets really good. So we're just going to have to watch and see if the seasonality happens this year. Makes sense. I expect a big summer. I, I really do expect a big summer at this point. Uh, just from the people I'm talking to, uh, the behavior I'm seeing at the club levels right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, college is letting out. It's all these younger kids that are going to be, you know, not, not having to worry about class. Not, they're going to go out <laughs> on the weekends or they're going to party. Yep. Yeah. And they're and, ready for it. And, they're dying for it. And, I mean, and it's like, you know, largely uh, nationally a maskless now um, kind of situation that we're in. Because last year, yeah, like we had all the variants of uh, COVID still top of mind. And New York, you still had to wear a mask everywhere. So I think that's oh, yeah. definitely, you know, the, the great. Minnesota put it back yeah. in for three weeks in January and all huh. the restaurants downtown closed again. Yeah. In January of this year. I mean, that was four months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so Minneapolis was, you know, we had the first big convention there uh, with VCon mm -hmm. uh, that's that's happened in three years. Mm -hmm. You remember two years ago, they had the George Floyd incident. So they've had, yep. you know, Minneapolis has just been a really rough market to, to do business in. And yet, you know, we've remained profitable, not as profitable as we used to be, mm -hmm. but we've remained profitable through, through, through the entire... Uh, the entire stance and now we're open again and now we're starting to see you know increases as the hotel uh rates go up in downtown minneapolis uh, i think we're going to continue to see uh some really nice improvements in that market chicago market 
has been since the day that club reopened mm -hmm. has been like, where'd all these people come from? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, uh, Miami, I mean, Tootsie's is, uh, it's a, it's just a beast. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I've never seen people wait in line in the rain before. <laughs> so for, for, and at Tootsie's, yeah. I got a video with three, I'm not kidding you, 300 people down the building, all the way down the road, waiting to get in during the middle of COVID. We had to close at midnight, so they had to be in the building by midnight to stay. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's sitting out there waiting in the rain trying to get in the building before midnight. I was like, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. Is that on, it, uh, is that on Twitter? Uh, I don't think I ever posted that video. Mm -hmm. I have to go back through and find that video and post it. Mm -hmm. Oh, Fintwit uh, will love that. You have yeah, to do that. I, it, this is how bad people want it. During COVID, this is how bad people wanted to get into Tootsies. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see people, which, well, our guys are walking out handing people, you know, uh, trash bags and they're picking people holding trash bags over there. These people are dressed to the nines, man. Yeah, yeah. And the rain is coming sideways. You can hold your, you almost <laughs> have to hold the trash bag at your side, not above your head, because it's not even coming from above your head. It's coming sideways. <laughs> Oh, and they're just standing it. out there, and we're trying to. We, what they were trying to do is, the manager originally was going to go out and get everybody's pager number or phone number, so they tell them go sit in your car. We'll page you when your it's your turn to come in, and you can <laughs> you know you can come up. And they were like, no, we're not getting out of line. You 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 know you won't let us in. You'll you'll you guys will cheat the line. Mm -hmm. and, you know everybody's worried about getting cheated in the line. <laughs> and, and for our shareholders who don't know, Tootsie's is probably the largest club in America. And it was formerly a BJ's wholesale warehouse that you guys purchased and retrofitted, which it's just a uh, very remote. What was our distribution center? Distribution center, that's right. Wow, yeah. I had no idea. We have 385,000 square feet under roof there, but we lease out uh, a bunch of it as warehouse space to uh, Yeah, there, to third there, there's even a room where yeah. you make the furniture for it. It's wild. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we have a full metal shop, a full wood mm -hmm. shop. We do all, we blow, well, they used to blow all the neon. Now we switched everything to LED, but uh, they still have all, this, all the tools and stuff to, to blow neon. Mm -hmm. There's still some neon tubes and stuff on the inside as you saw oh. but uh yeah they build all that stuff it's it's amazing we have eighty three thousand square feet of indoor parking so all of our vi all of our entertainers <laughs> all our vip parking all park indoors that is like disney world for uh, adult entertainment mm -hmm. yes that's mm -hmm. what they call it yeah that's <laughs> definitely and so eric one one thing that i want to touch on before we let you go is your web 3 strategy because obviously we've noticed the uptake in twitter interactions on FinTwit, but that's all very, very focused for a certain reason, right? Maybe talk a little bit about Tip and Strip and kind of what your plans are there. Sure. Yeah, well, you know, the website's tipandstrip.io, and what we're doing with this is creating a, a loyalty program, uh, So, but in the true NFT sense, where there's gonna be rarity levels, mm -hmm. different rarity levels get you different uh, benefits. Those rarity levels are all random, uh, so it's not like I pay more, I get more. Mm -hmm. It's everybody pays a flat price and you have chances of getting uh, these rare uh, NFTs. Uh, and they're going to start out with basic, you know, you and a friend get in free. You and three friends get in free. You and three friends get in free and you get VIP. Mm -hmm. You and three friends get in free, you get VIP. And once every three months, every quarter, you get free bottle service table. Uh, then it goes to every 60 days, then every 30 days. And then there's going to be 10 basically ultra rare that also gets you a birthday party, like the birthday party video I posted when, for my birthday mm -hmm. for, for the 10 holders of those. They'll get a birthday party in their birth month every year. Uh, you'll get, uh, there's going to be some one of ones that we're working on uh, with some special deals. One of them is going to be to go to the Super Bowl with me. I've, I've been to the Super Bowl almost every year. I think I've missed two years since 2001, wow. since 2002. Uh, so we go to the Super Bowls. Uh, so I'm going to take somebody to the Super Bowl with me, uh, one lucky holder. Uh, another one is going to be, we're going to do an annual party every every July. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to do a big party at Tootsie's for NFT, for NFT holders only. It's going to be a blowout. We're going to have a huge budget for uh, celebrity guests, uh, uh, celebrity porn star feature entertainers, uh, influencers that are going to come perform or whatever at the club. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's going to be a, a, I think, a big draw. And one of the one of the one on ones will be you'll be at the owner's table. So you'll be at my table uh, with your friend, you and a friend at my table for that event. And maybe you and three friends. We don't know. We're 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 working all that out still on all the details. But that's going to be one of the one of ones. And uh, so you'll get to meet all the celebrities. You'll get to meet, you know, basically we'll be brought by our table at one point or another mm -hmm. throughout the night. And uh, 
and it'll just be a big throwdown party. Uh, huh. I'm trying to figure it's, out what we're doing for the hangover the next day. We got to add a little <laughs> bonus in there for the hangover because I'm sure we're all going to be very hungover the next day after uh, that's, after a party like that. That's we amazing. Get some IV drips. Oh yeah. Right. We might have to get some oxygen <laughs> mm-hmm. tanks on on site oxygen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> come, come back at noon the next day. Get some oxygen tags, IV drips, and have some uh, chicken tenders. Yeah. I think I only ate the chicken tenders <laughs> and fries for the four days I was there, and they're phenomenal. Man, you have to get the flank steak with the chimichurri Next time. sauce on it. Oh, time. chimichurri. And the rice good. and beans. Those rice and beans. Mm. Oh. Just last thing I'm seeing. This this is on uh, Ethereum, so it's it's very forward. I'm looking on the website. I see, like, the developers. They all have their NFTs. I see you have, like, a uh, what looks like a vampire-draped guy as your Rick's CEO.eth. Um I mean, it's amazing, and like one of the best. Oh, I don't know what I don't know which one I had. They they screenshotted that from my early days of NFTs. I I need to go look and see what they have on there. I actually changed to an actual picture so yeah. that uh, we could get verified and uh, yeah and make the account just a little more serious. And it, uh, you know, I first started on Twitter. I only was I only joined Twitter for for to research the NFTs because uh, mm-hmm. uh, my son actually uh, is the head of that project. And uh, he's the one that brought it to us and said, look, we need to do this. This is a great benefits program. These are things we can do. And uh, now we've got it tied in. So you can actually buy, I think starting this weekend, you can you can start pre, pre-buying mm. okay. the NFTs with your, with a credit card. Okay. And it goes, just you need a credit card and an email address. And it goes into a uh, custodial wallet. And then yep. when uh, the actual mint goes live, you can provide your actual wallet to, to transfer it into your wallet. Uh, yeah. That's, once it goes live, but uh, it's going to be amazing the, the things that this kid's coming up with and to make it ease of use for our existing customers as well as bringing in the NFT. And we're going to take these two worlds and merge them together. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it's going to be incredible as they uh, as they go, especially the, the, the parties. And, you know, we do one annual party, but I guarantee you, I mean, parties are what we do. So <laughs> we will end up throwing <laughs> other parties. I guarantee you we're going to do a huge party at uh, ETH Denver. Mm-hmm. Uh, during the conference because we have Diamond Cabaret there. Uh, well, we have five clubs there, but but we'll end up doing the party at Diamond Cabaret, and then we'll do an After Hours. Uh, there's actually a club in Diamond Cabaret called After Hours or After Dark. I can't I can't remember. That opens or at maybe it's After Dark, After Hours, After Dark or something. <laughs> yeah, it opens at midnight, and uh, so we'll uh, you know it's just like a regular dance club, so it's got dance floors and DJs, and so we'll bring in probably a you know big name DJ for that, and. Mm-hmm. And do a lot of fun stuff for East Denver. I'm, I'm thinking, uh, you know, N- NFT NYC in June before the launch. You know, we're the official after hours party, uh, after after party after hours party. I think so. We're like the the late night uh, deal because we're open at 4 a.m. And uh, so all three nights of uh, of that uh, event will be there. Plus, we're going to be at the events as well. So, be a lot of fun. Some really amazing. Utility. Amazing. Real, real world utility, right, Lit? Yeah, we web, love to see yeah, that. You add Web two plus Web three, you're now in Web five. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, it's two and a half. That's what they're calling it. I mean, they're actually yeah. calling it Web two and a half. All right. Well, yeah. Right, because you're you're bran- you're, yeah. you're 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 branching. And what what it really is is so when I first got into the crypto and NFTs, I thought, eh, you know, this is mm-hmm. cool. It's fun. I like the art. You know, I'm having fun. Whatever. Mm-hmm. It's it's you know, for forty bucks or sixty bucks, I can buy this stupid looking hot dog or I can buy this, <laughs> I can buy this ape or I can mm-hmm. buy this, you know, now I'm not buying, you know, a, a million dollar ape. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'll leave that for this. Leave that for the California guys and <laughs> Hollywood guys. Uh, but, uh, but then when I started looking at blockchain, mm-hmm. that's when I got excited. Mm-hmm. I was like, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. So I can give somebody ownership of something mm-hmm. and it's anonymous. Mm-hmm. They can just put it in a, throw away, you know, a burner phone or burner wallet, as they call it. And that could be the only thing in their wallet. But every time they come to my club, I can verify that it's them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I started getting excited. And I said, so, well, what can we give them? You know, mm-hmm. what can we, you know, can we, can we, so I bought this game pass that every 30 days I get another game pass. Mm-hmm. I said, well, can I do something where every 30 days I give them a bottle of liquor, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a bottle table? Or every 60 days or every night. Yeah, we can build timers in. We can do this. So we started talking with the developer, the programmers, the back of, you know, the con- they're going to write our smart contracts mm-hmm. and make all this stuff work. And they're like, yeah, you, nobody's ever done that before, but we can do that. We can do this and we can. And I've come up with some ideas. They go, well, I don't know if we can do that yet. I said, that's the right attitude. Mm. <laughs> Figure out how to do it. You've got 
you've got about a month and a half left. Figure out how to do it. I want it to do this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's really cool. Is you know, so these things are going to be annual. So you'll have to renew at the end of 2023. Mm-hmm. You'll buy a renewal vial or you know whatever it is, a refill, whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. I, who knows what they're going to come up with? It'll be another piece of art, I'm sure. And then you'll you'll refill your utility. But the beauty is based on some of it's going to be based on usage. Some of it's just going to be completely random. But you'll every time you renew, you'll have a chance to move up to the next level. Mm-hmm. Or, or you know, a next there'll be different rarity levels. You can you can so you can move up rarity levels and gain more benefits. So the longer you have it, the more off you know, the number every years you renew it. Excuse me, it could get higher and higher utility. And we're going to continue add utility uh, as much as we can uh, at, as we learn from our holders uh, what uh, you know what's important to them. Amazing, amazing, Eric. This was fantastic. Thank you so much for joining yeah. us. We really appreciate it. You, you bet. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. The uh, the first of hopefully many more. Yeah. No uh, problem. Anytime you need me, you know I'll be there. This has been Big Swinging Decks by Liquidity with your hosts, Lit and Mark Moran. This is a Red Rock Music podcast. Our executive producer is Red Yoakum. Our associate producer is Emma Martins. For more, follow us on Instagram at liquidity and at it's Mark Moran. Or visit the official website liquidity.co. So tune in weekly to your managing director secretary's favorite podcast. Available wherever you listen to podcasts.